My name is Eric Gucci. I'm the lead pastor here at Cornerstone Church. If this is your first time here, thank you so much for coming. We're absolutely delighted you're here today. I also want to give a big shout out to the Dream Team. Those are everyone that serves at Cornerstone Church. We want to thank you so much. Last week, we had our Christmas candlelight services. We had five services and over 1,200 people participated and came to our services. Many people responded to giving their lives to Christ for the very first time, and many others were just encouraged, which is always important. Well, today we're so delighted to have with us Rob and Sarah Malcolm. Rob and Sarah Malcolm serve at Yale University at a ministry called Chi Alpha, which reaches out to Yale students, giving them a community and helping folks come to know Jesus Christ. So would you please give a warm welcome to Rob and Sarah Malcolm? And today, Rob's gonna share the word today. Thank you so much. We look forward to seeing you next week, and God bless. Good morning. How are we? Are we well? You know, I've kept on saying for the last week, I'm going to stop eating sugar. And then my wife says, I've made more cookies. No. So my name is Rob Malcolm, along with my wife, Sarah. We are missionaries at Yale University. The movement that we are all part of, the Assemblies of God, has an organization called Chi Alpha. And Chi Alpha basically means Christ's ambassadors. And we are the outreach to the secular universities of America. We're on over 300 universities mobilizing about 30,000 students. And yes, my accent isn't local. I am Scottish, okay? I've lived in the U.S. for almost 10 years now. Again, I want to just say thank you. Thank you so much because you support us as missionaries, both in prayer and in finance. You allow us to be the hands and feet of Jesus at Yale University. We've been there five years now, and we've seen students come to Christ. We've seen students come back to Christ, and we've seen many of them deepen the relationship with Christ. So thank you so much for enabling us to do that at Yale. So this morning, I want to begin by doing a little imagination exercise. Can you imagine something with me? Can we do that? Imagine I am a juggler. Now, the reason I've got to get you to imagine is I can't juggle. If I could juggle, I would be juggling right now, but I can't. But I am such a good imaginary juggler, I could be on America's Got Talent. I mean, I am talking fire sticks. I'm not quite at chainsaws, but the day is coming, okay? And here I am juggling. Now, normally when we think of, wait, I've cut them, oh, cut them. Normally when we're juggling, what we think about are those little multicolored balls, yeah? But that's not what I'm juggling. Let me share with you what I'm juggling today. I'm juggling my life. And often at this point of year, even though we often think of the new year being a time of hope, often it can be time of reflection. And often it's not always good reflection because we look at the things we're juggling. So here I am juggling. So what am I juggling today? Well, let me catch them again. Here's the first thing I'm juggling. I'm juggling what I do as a missionary. And often I'm asking myself the question, is what I do important? Is it significant? Do people care? Another thing I'm juggling is my marriage. And I'm asking myself questions like, am I a good husband? Do I know what it means to be a good husband? I'm also juggling my kids. I have two young kids, nine and six years old. Am I a good father to my kids? Then I'm juggling my finances. And I don't know about you, but it feels like there's a ticker tape in my head that just says, if we just had a little bit more, if we just had a little bit more, and that ticker tape is going round and round. And then there's my friendships. Am I a good friend? Do I know what it means to be a good friend? Do I have good friendships? And you see all these things I'm juggling every day. I'm juggling them all the time. They're my burdens. I have to carry them. I can't suddenly get rid of my wife or my family or my job. Or I, I have them every day and I'm juggling them. But then, the world likes to throw in more, doesn't it? So just when we think we're coping with all these things we're juggling, something else comes in. It's normally a curveball. We don't expect it, but suddenly we're juggling something else. And then the world says something to us. It says this. 
You are all you need. Keep juggling by yourself. You don't need anyone else. Show the world your strength by juggling on your own. You carry your burdens. Show them you're independent. Don't show any weakness by needing anyone else. Do it yourself. You are all you need. So we keep walking, juggling all these things by ourselves. But then the world says something else to us. It says, yeah, but that person over there, they're juggling better than you. And that person over there, well, they're juggling a lot more than you. You need to do better. So we end up juggling even more. All these things, all these burdens we're juggling all the time. And the world throws something else and tells us to compare and to contrast with someone else. And we keep going. Is it just me? What are you juggling this morning? Maybe it's your job. And maybe you're saying, I don't like my job, but it pays the bills. I don't have any options, so I've got to keep on keeping on. Maybe you're juggling your marriage this morning. And maybe the burden is that no one knows that your marriage is a mess. But you ain't going to tell anybody, we're going to sort this ourselves. Or maybe it's your kids. Maybe the burden you're carrying this morning is, Will my kids love Jesus? Or maybe it's, my kids are just distant from me. I have no relationship with my kids. Or maybe it's the friendship one. Maybe you have a sense of loneliness. Do you know that we are increasingly lonely as a society? And maybe this morning, you're juggling the burden of, I don't feel like I have any friends. I don't know what burdens you're carrying this morning. You fill in the blanks. But here we are, we're juggling them all. And we come into church this morning, we're still juggling them. But remember, the world teaches me they're mine. And I gotta bear my burdens. I'm gonna show the world my strength, my resilience by doing it on my own. So this morning, let us look at a beautiful Jesus story. For Jesus comes along and looks at us and says, what are you doing? I never made you to live like this. You were not designed to live this way. Let me show you a different way of living. Can we do that this morning? Let's pray. Jesus. Lord, this morning we come before you and we invite you into this moment by your Spirit. Holy Spirit, come and change us that we leave differently from the way we came in. We should not leave this place in the same way, Holy Spirit. That you would redeem us, that you would change how we think and how we live. Holy Spirit, you're welcome in this place. Be the life of God, the power of God in this house. Jesus, bring these words to life. Words of redemption. Words of life that changes. Father, receive all the glory. All for the glory of your name. And we all said, amen. So let's read a story together. Let's read Matthew 11, verses 28 through 30. Matthew 11, 28 through 30. Most of us know this story. For some of us, this is maybe the first time we've ever heard it. But can I say to you, if we lived this scripture our lives would be so different. So let's read it together. What does it say? Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, some of us have heard that scripture a hundred times. For some of us, it may be the first time. But if we took this into our soul, we would be changed. So what's the first thing we see in this scripture? What's the first thing we see in this story? It's a really simple thing, and it just goes like this. Jesus sees that we're trying to juggle life by ourselves and invites change. That, that's the most obvious statement, but it's right there. What does the scripture open with? Jesus says, come to me all who are weary. There's no exclusions. There's no limitations. Jesus says, come everyone to me. 
He doesn't say, if you do this or if you do that. No, no. Come, all who are weary and in heavy, and heavy laden. These words are so opposite, so different from our culture. Let me show you why. Every day you are surrounded by people who are juggling so much, aren't we? Every day. Burdens they're bearing. And we don't help. We look at them and we think, I could help, but I'm just going to get a name for that person who's always interfering. So I don't want that name. I don't want that reputation as someone who just interferes in other people's lives. So I'm not going to offer to help. Or it's the flip side. It's the other side of the coin that says, what if I offer help and they reject me? And they say, I don't need your help. I don't need your charity. I can do this, what? On my own. And pride rises. I don't need it. We're okay. So we feel rejection. But do you know what? I think there's one more reason, and it's the real big reason underneath it all. Why do we not offer to help others? It's simply this. No one's helping me. Who's helping me? I'm having to carry all this stuff myself. Who's offering to help me with my burdens? So because of that, we don't help. So when Jesus comes along and says, come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy laden, when there's no limitations, no exclusions, it is so counter the culture and society we live in, where we're taught, do it on your own. You are all you need. And what does he say for us to bring? He says your burdens, your toils, your heavy labors, the things you carry that you juggle every day, bring them to me. But instead, we just keep marching side by side in a line, juggling away. There's a story about a fifth grade class in Oceanside, California. And in that class, there was a young boy called Ian O'Gorman. And in his fifth grade, he developed lymphoma, a type of cancer. So that poor kid is having to bear the burden, is having to juggle cancer. But then, of course, he starts treatment. And what happens when you have cancer treatment so often? He lost his hair. So now not only does he have to bear the burden on the inside, everyone can see him bearing it on the outside. He has no hair. He was one of 14 boys in that class. Do you know what the other 13 boys did? They shaved their heads. All 14 of them were now bald. You see, he, not, he no longer had to bear that burden on his own. Why is it we can do it in fifth grade, but when we become adults, it's every man for himself? You see, I think we were born to do that, but then society and culture teaches us, no, no, you're all you need. Show your strength by doing it on your own. So we march in lines, juggling. So when Jesus comes along and says, I see you, I see how you're living. You don't have to live this way. It's almost too shocking to believe. It's so opposite to how we're called to live. There is this little gene within us, the independence gene. I don't need you. I don't need anyone. I can do it on my own. Come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. What's the second thing we see in this story? What's the second thing we see? This is the one we don't like. But what he offers isn't what we think is best. Wait, what? What do you mean what he offers us isn't what we think is best? Well, in my understanding, if I just read verse 28, it's awesome. Come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Period, full stop, that's it. Let's not move on. That's a great verse. Ah, but then slides in verse 29. You see, in my imagination, verse 28 is awesome. I have a backpack on. It is full of my burdens, my heavy load, the things I carry every day. Big stones. And Jesus says, come to me with your... Oh, thank you, Jesus. And I take off my backpack and I put it at his feet and I'm like, oh, that 
feels so good. Thanks, Jesus. I don't have to carry anything again. And then he says, here, put this backpack on and said, wait, what? <laughs> no, time out, Jesus. You don't understand. You're going to carry all my burdens for me. I'm going to have a great life. That, that, that's a deal. If I only read verse 28. But in comes verse 29. Take my yoke upon you. No, no. Time out, Jesus. No. I, I don't want to put anything on. You see, we're taught, again, in our society, get everything off you. If you don't like it, put it, take it off. You don't like that marriage, take it off. You don't like your friendships, take them off. You don't like your job, take it off. You don't like your family, take it off. You're always carrying burdens. We can't not. You need a job, you're carrying that burden. You have a family, you carry that burden. You have kids, you carry that burden. You have friendships, you carry that burden. We cannot not carry things. So when Jesus says, hey, come to me, great. Take my yoke upon you. No, not so good. Now, when I hear yoke, I think of an egg. I'm like, I don't know what yoke means. I'm not carrying eggs. That looks weird. But you see, when Jesus told that story, the people standing around them were like, that's awesome. You see, they had to carry physical burdens every day. You want water, you put it in a pitcher or a wineskin. You want food, you're going to have to carry it. No plastic bags, people. It was hard. So you have to carry things. But if you put this physical thing on called a yoke, this piece of wood over your shoulders, suddenly carrying those things was much easier. You still had to carry them, but suddenly you could stand up tall and you could walk. So when Jesus said, take my yoke upon you, they got it. Now, please do not put a physical piece of wood over your shoulders and walk about like that. That's just weird, right? That's not the yoke he's talking about. When Jesus says, take my yoke upon you, then what does he mean? Well, it's three things. Take on the yoke of prayer, take on the yoke of scripture, and take on the yoke of community. And if you take these three yokes on, Watch what he'll do. Watch the miraculous in your life with your burdens when you take on this yoke. The yoke of prayer, the yoke of scripture, and the yoke of Christian community. What do I mean? Well, God, my marriage is a mess. I'm not personally saying that, by the way. My marriage is really good. God, my marriage is a mess. But I'm just going to deal with my own own. We'll, just, we'll fix our problems. Because really, it's all her problem. It's all her fault. She's the one with the issues. But then we take on the yoke of prayer. And God begins to speak to us and says, humble yourself and realize it's you. Ah, I don't like that. But then when we take on that yoke of prayer and we realize we need to work on this together, that burden gets a little bit smaller. Maybe it's your finances. And that ticker tape is in your head of, if there was only more, if there was only a little bit more, if there was only a little bit more. Then you take on the yoke of Scripture, and you begin to read in Scripture God's promises about you. And that he'll never leave you nor forsake you, that he cares more about you than you would believe. And suddenly begin to go to Scripture, and you're like, wait a minute here, actually financially we're good. We're actually okay. In fact, I'm going to give more away. I'm going to be radically generous. Because we took on the yoke of reading scripture, that burden got a lot lighter. Maybe it's your kids. I don't know. And maybe you're thinking, they seem so distant from me. But you take on the yoke of Christian community and you share your burden with your brothers and sisters in this house. And you say, can I tell you something? It is breaking my heart, but it seems like my kids are getting further and further away from me. And when you come alongside someone who is trustworthy and wise and maybe has walked that path longer than you, they can turn around and say, yeah, it's okay. Let me pray for you. Let me stand with you. Let me encourage you. Let me speak into this moment. That burden disappears. You see, when you take on the yoke of Jesus, the yoke of scripture, the yoke of prayer, the yoke of Christian community, burdens get smaller and lighter and some will even disappear. 
Miraculous things happen only when we take on that yoke. Because we've invited Jesus in. It's like the end of the Lord of the Rings movies, if you've seen them. The quest to destroy the ring. Sam and Frodo have to climb Mount Doom. It's the last part. It's just the two of them now. If you're familiar with the stories, I would be like Frodo. Or I'd be like Sam. I'd be like, Frodo, I don't want to do this with you. You've been mean to me. I've almost died because of you. I ain't climbing the mountain. Do it on your own. Frodo might be like, yeah, it's my quest. I want all the glory. Move on. Let me do it by myself. But that's not what happens. They finish the quest together. They climb the mount together. They were yoked together. Because what's the final thing we see in this scripture? The final thing is this. The result of taking on this yoke is rest. Have your burdens disappeared? No. You still have a job. You still maybe have a mortgage. You still maybe have family and friends and fill in the blanks, whatever it may be. You're still juggling them. They're still there. But because you took the yoke upon you, things are changing miraculously. Burdens get lighter and smaller, and some will even disappear. Because you went to Jesus when he said, come. And the result is rest. You get up in the morning, the day presses in, but you walk through it. You're not oblivious to everything in front of you. It's still there. The day is still there. But you took time to pray. And God probably spoke. You read scripture. You're possibly encouraged. Someone texted you just to give you a word for the day. And those burdens got lighter and smaller and some disappeared and you walked through that day. And you had rest for your soul. Does that not sound good? Just to breathe. To have rest for your soul. I want to finish this morning by telling you a personal story. Does anyone remember May the 15th of this year? What was significant about May the 15th, 2018? Well, this picture might jog your memory. Is it going to come up? Tornadoes came through Connecticut, remember? May the 15th, tornadoes came through Connecticut. Guess where one went through? That was my cars. My minivan became a pickup. My little car got a sunroof. I never asked for a sunroof. So, May the 15th, 2018, 5 p.m., thunderstorms are coming through. I go onto our back deck. Now, I'm Scottish. We don't do tornadoes. And in my mind, Connecticut doesn't do tornadoes. So I'm on my back deck. And I start shouting at my wife, Sarah, come and see the cool storm. Come and see, come and see. Now, my wife grew up in Missouri. <laughs> she came out in the back deck and she's like, oh, no, 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 no. But of course, in her mind, what's she waiting to hear? Sirens. We don't have them in Connecticut. So we're like, there's no tornadoes. We don't get tornadoes in Connecticut. It's fine. But let's come in the house anyway. So we came into the house. But we're like, it's fine. And then suddenly both of our phones started to beep, beep. Tornado warning. It's Connecticut. Overcautious. We'll be okay. But let us maybe go to the basement. And as we grab our two kids, we get, we haven't even got to the basement. We hear the Boom. And down came the tree. Now, praise God, it didn't hit the house. Number one fact, it wasn't even our tree. It was our neighbor's tree. We have hated that tree for years. It had two trunks. 70 feet, 70 feet. One trunk went straight up our driveway. Boom. One trunk went over both cars and into our yard. So when we come back up the stairs 30 minutes later, my wife's like, eh, we have a problem. The cars are destroyed. And we look out our front window, and this is what we see. Immediately, I have some things to juggle. Of course, the first thought is, 
How am I going to replace two cars? We need two cars for what we do. How am I going to replace two cars? But then my nine-year-old and six-year-old begin to say things like, are we okay? Are we okay? Is there more to come? Because suddenly they're getting anxious and stressed. And now I'm juggling my kids. Now, what would the world teach me? Solve this problem yourself. You can do it on your own. Boast of your independence that you solved this issue. But I'm not of the world. I'm a disciple of Jesus. I follow him. I had all the emotions of the moment, but I turned and I prayed what would seem like pathetic prayers. Jesus, you just got to help. You got to help, Jesus. I have no idea what we're going to do. Jesus, you got to help my kids. You got to help us work out what we do about the car. You see, I took on the yoke of prayer straight away. We lost power for days. When the guy finally came out to look at our trees to have them removed, he's like, yeah, I have 180 people in front of you. It's going to be weeks. So for weeks, we lived with this front view. I would look out my front windows, and I'm like, it's the end of the world. I looked out the back windows. It was beautiful. I would just look out our back windows. No, everything's good. Everything's great. No, I ain't looking that way. No. But my wife began to pray. And she felt God say, watch and see what I will do. And of course, she called her mother, my mother-in-law. And she told them the story. And my parents-in-law went straight into parent-in-law mode. Right, we will just give you a loan to put down to get new cars. Do you need us to fly out? No, we're good. We're okay. We're okay. But my mother-in-law went to prayer. And she felt God say, watch and see what I will do. And I took on the yoke of Scripture. And I reminded myself in Scripture that we were going to be okay. We were genuinely okay. No one was hurt. That God was looking after us. That God would carry us through. No matter what happened, he cared for us. He saw the end from the beginning. Give him. He says, give me your burdens. Give me these things. Don't be anxious. Don't fray. Let me give you my peace. So we began to pray that. And the burdens got lighter and smaller but they were still there. Anyway, we had just begun to save to replace the cars in like five years' time. So that little amount was here. Then we got fair market value from the insurance company to replace the cars. I'm like, they ain't Hot Wheels. This will cover three Hot Wheels at Stop and Shop. You realize that, don't you? So we had a little bit put together. Then I go to a, a conference, a, a pastor's conference, and we, we'd shared the burden with friends saying, will you pray for us? Please pray. And they brought me up on stage and gave me a check for $10,000 and said, use that towards your replacement cars. And then I got connected with another, through another friend of a man who gives pastors, who sells the cars to them at wholesale price. I had never met this guy before, but suddenly I, this connection is made. So we bought two new-to-us cars, new-to-us, and we didn't take on any debt because we waited to see what God would do because we had the burden of prayer. We took on the yoke of Scripture, and we took on the yoke of Christian community. It could have worked out a different way. That's the way God chose it to go. But I've been able to share that story with people who have no faith, to talk about a God who loves us, a God who says, bring your burdens to me. Take my yoke upon you, because my burden's easy and my yoke's light, and you will find rest for your soul. What are you juggling today? What things are you carrying that you are not meant to carry? What are you struggling with that you need to give to him? Is it your family, your marriage? Is it your finances, your job, friendship? I don't know, you fill in the blanks. But Jesus looks at every one of you this morning and says, what are you doing? Come to me. I see you. I see everything you're juggling. Everything you're struggling with, every burden, every heavy load. Come on, come to me. 
take my yoke upon you. What's my yoke? It's prayer. It's scripture. It's Christian family. And watch what I will do. But you've got to come. Will you come to him this morning? Will you pour it out? Watch what he will do. Jesus cares more about your future than you do. He wants to redeem your soul. We are all broken. And he loves to redeem and to make new. And his call this morning is simply, come. Would you come to him? Let's pray. Jesus. Jesus, you're the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You are the Alpha and the Omega. You're the beginning and the end. Before Abraham was, you said, I am. There is none like you. You're the lion and the lamb. You are our friend, our king, our savior, our Lord. We don't get to pick and choose those, Jesus. It's all or nothing. So this morning, I pray for every head bowed in this house. That they would come, they would bring their burdens to you. And they would take your yoke upon you. Holy Spirit, supernaturally work in this place. That people will begin to give things over to you. They will surrender things. In prayer, in reading scripture, in confession to those around them that you will do a mighty work in their lives. Now, while every head is bowed and every eye is closed, maybe for some of you in here, you've never actually asked Jesus into your life. You've never actually surrendered you to him. You see, that independence that we have is a mark of what we call the fall. That we think that we can live our life on our own. We become our own God. We are all we need. It's a sign of our rebellion. And the manifestation, the fruit of this sin is death. And this morning, you have the beautiful opportunity to pass from death to life. When you simply surrender your life to Jesus and you say, I cannot live this life on my own. I am a mess. And the biggest mess are those of us who believe that we're fine. (laughs) As we sang this morning, you then become a child of God. What did that song say? In my father's house, there's a place for you. When you choose to give Jesus your life, you are welcomed into the family of God. He has left the 99 for you, the one. Why would he do that? Because of his love for you. God does not need you to complete his love. He is complete in love. But he invites you into his love. But it requires surrender. It requires open hands before him saying, I give you everything. Every part of my life, I give it to you. So this morning, while every head is bowed and every eye is closed, maybe you've never done that before, Would you make eye contact with me to say this morning, thank you. I'm going to give my life to you. I see you. Anyone else this morning? Beautiful. Following Jesus is like nothing else. I have never found more meaning or purpose in my life than following Jesus. He is redeeming my brokenness. He is changing me to be like him. It is the best thing. Let's pray. Father, thank you for every, everyone that decided this morning to say, I will follow you. I give up surrender of my life for you. I choose to let you become king. That I can sing, I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. And that they would know this morning, Father, that you declared truth that says, 
there's a place in your house for them. Father, thank you. You are a good God. And we love you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.